Who are the people responsible for making sure that the human race is healthy, it's fit, it's strong, it's disease free. If we get injured or if we do get sick or if we do get a disease, we can recover quickly. Who's responsible for all of that? And oh, there's a big question. Uh, here's the first one. If I'm an adult and I've got a human body that I live in every day, should I take responsibility for it? Uh, and uh, I was given a serious uh, challenge by a head doctor, by a psychiatrist in one of my health clubs in, in Sydney, Australia, when I was very young, to say, Rowie, if you are an exercise professional, yes, you can help people to be healthy, fit and strong, but ultimately, if people want to be healthy, particularly mentally healthy, they need to take responsibility for their own health. And I said, please explain, and the answer was this, the closer we are to taking full responsibility for everything that happens to us in our lives, the more mentally healthy we are, the more mentally strong we are. The more we blame other people for the condition that we're in or what's happened to our lives, or the more we just don't take responsibility for our own lives, we blame somebody else, whether it's the government or our parents or our teachers or or life itself, uh, the more mentally weak we become. And I'm sharing that with you because as an exercise professional, uh, do we need to help people become self-motivated, self-inspired, self-educated and self-responsible for their healthy, fit, strong body? I would like to think that that's me. I don't want somebody else controlling my health. I don't want somebody else telling me what to eat or how to exercise. I want to take full control of my health and be responsible for my health. However, <laughs> uh, are there times when I've had to go to the doctor? Are there times where I need to use, uh, need to involve the help of other allied health professionals? And of course, the answer is yes. And as an exercise professional, will I have clients? Will I have people in my life, whether they're members at my health club or people that come to my group exercise classes or people that I'm, I am their personal exercise coach? Is it possible that I will need to have a a, a medical a professional, an allied health professional that I can refer them to. So whether it's a chiropractor or a physiotherapist or a dietitian or a naturopath or a osteopath or doesn't matter, whatever that person has in their headspace is another allied health professional that they want to be involved with. Uh, should I, as an exercise professional, have a good referral base and should I know how to communicate with those people effectively so that we can work together with our client to make sure that they're happy, healthy, fit and strong. So number one is personal responsibility. Then number two, who are we going to ask for help? Who are we going to bring into our inner circle that we can either refer ourselves to if we, if, we ha if we have a medical challenge or we need to talk to somebody else about our human body and what about who are we going to send our clients to. And this is where it becomes really tricky. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of times where it's been, uh, it's bit me in the bum and I've lost clients because of the way I've referred people to another allied health professional. But I'm also going to share with you that if you don't have a good referral base, then uh, there will be times when you have to refer people on and you need to have the right people to do that with. So I'll give you my first example. I had a client who uh, she thought that she had some kind of food allergy uh, and she wanted to talk to an, a professional, a food professional about her food allergy. Now that's not my area of expertise. Of course, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a dietitian. I don't ever pretend to be. So I felt that it was my responsibility to then find her a great nutritionist dietitian. So I did what I thought was good uh, research on finding her a great dietitian. And I was in Brisbane, Australia at the time, and I spoke to some top level sports people who shared with me that there was a particular dietitian in Brisbane that all the sports people went to, and she was the best there was, and that's who I should refer my client to. So I just gave my client that person's number. Uh, and I, I will share with you, it was one of the biggest mistakes I've made in my career. Now, the first part was, my client trusted me to do better research than that. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you the end of the story. <laughs> it was horrible. Uh, my client went off to see the dietitian, she, and she had to drive across town. She literally had to do it probably an hour and a half in the traffic across Brisbane to go and visit this dietitian. And when she came back, instead of going home, she came back to the health club to abuse me. She was fuming with me and she used some words that would be highly inappropriate for me to use uh, unless uh, I was uh, speaking uh, filth out of my mouth. But this is how angry she was. 
She said, you sent me to that stupid woman. Why did you send me to such a stupid person? And it turned out that the dietitian had been, unfortunately, like a lot of medical people are, uh, very dogmatic. She'd said to my client, this is what you have to eat. This is what you can't eat. Uh, this is a list of foods that I'm telling you that you have to basically this woman was telling my client what to do and apart from the fact that she wasn't used to that because that's certainly not my style uh, she was really annoyed that this woman had spoken to her like she was a child had spoken to her with what she felt was condescending disrespect and I didn't know any of that because I didn't do the right research. So what I'm asking you to do is, yes, please, have a really good circle of influence around you of top-level medical professionals, of allied health professionals that you can refer your client, clients to, but please go and have a consultation with them yourself. Go and see them yourself. Go and talk to them and find out who they really are. Uh, and I have since found out that... Uh, uh, that's a dietitian that I wouldn't have appreciated being spoken to or had, had spoken to me either. And if I had gone through that process, I would have realized that. So do we need to have good allied health professionals around us? Uh, yes. Uh, what kind of people? We have to work that out. We have to go and do our own research. Uh, the second example is a very personal one, which is my mother and a general practitioner. Uh, and of course, there's a big uh, stigma attached to a doctor. People believe their doctor, they trust their doctor. When somebody calls themselves a doctor, we kind of go, oh, doctor. Well, my mother who had, uh, and you've probably heard her story, she was diagnosed with advanced osteoporosis at 74. And by the time she was 80, because she'd had a personal trainer, she'd been doing strength training, she'd been doing boxing, she'd been doing running in soft sand, she'd been doing some quite aggressive swimming in the ocean every day, she'd been climbing up and down stairs every day, uh, we got rid of her osteoporosis. At 80 years of age, she had a, a bone mineral density test, which showed that we had re completely reversed her osteoporosis. So my mother had great quality of life. Literally, she was walking up and down 12 flights of stairs every day because she had an apartment. We took her out of a retirement village and put her into a beautiful apartment on the ocean on the Gold Coast. So she had to climb down the stairs. She would uh, go across to the, to the beach. She would run up and down the soft sand. This is an 80-year-old woman, by the way. Uh, she would then she would uh, get into the ocean and do what she called washing machines. So she'd dive into the surf and tumble, turn around and around in the surf. Rain, hail, shine, cold, hot, doesn't matter. Ask the surf lifesavers at the Gold Coast. So my mother had this really top quality of life. Kind of very long story short, she wanted to go and visit my brother and she took a train trip, a very long train trip across Australia. And on that train trip, all she did was sit down. So she either sat down and watched the, the scenery go by or she laid in her bed. It was a long train trip across Australia. When she arrived at the end of her trip, she had a sore back. And my brother was concerned about his 80-year-old mother having a sore back, so he took her to the doctor. And the doctor told my mother that she was too old to strength train. She was too old to be sprinting on the beach. She was too old to be swimming in the ocean. She was too old to be boxing and lifting weights, and she shouldn't be doing any of that. Now, there's an interesting challenge there because when you are the exercise professional who's the daughter, it's very hard to argue with the doctor. I have a, a special... Uh, extra person in my life of course who's my husband uh, and my mum loved my husband so he and he didn't want to tell her what to do either and he certainly didn't want to disagree with the doctor but he did ask my mother if she would be interested in getting a second opinion from a different kind of doctor so we took my mother to a sports physician so not just a general practitioner but a doctor that had then gone on to do eight ten maybe longer years of study specializing in sport and of course, the sports physician's role is to get sports people back on the, on the playing field as quickly as possible, get them back on the track, get them back in the pool, get them back playing their sport as quickly as possible. So they usually have a different headspace. It's not about stop people from exercising. It's about how can we get them back exercising as quickly as possible. So this was the difference in the, the professional medical advice. So the GP had said to my mother, don't do any of that. It's bad for you. You're too old. The sports physician gave my mother what I consider to be the ultimate motivational chat when it comes to exercise. And I'm so privileged that I was there to hear it because there was K-Man, myself, and my mother in with the doctor. And here comes little Broody. It's my 
nearly, he's going to be 20, and we, I think that's in, in doggy years, that's like 140. So may we all live to 140 and still be uh, running around the house like he does. Anyway, so uh, this sports physician said to my Dr. Paul Ohms, and he was on the Gold Coast, and he shared with my mother, Mrs. Cesarin, and he spoke to her quite um, frankly. He said, if you exercise, there is a 50% chance that you will get injured, Mrs. Cesarin. You might drop a weight on your toe. You might get, get bitten by a, a, a stingray in the ocean. Uh, you might trip down the stairs. Something could happen, and there is a 50% chance that if you exercise, you'll get injured or you'll get some kind of bodily damage, which, by the way, will recover. But if, Mrs. Cesarin, you stop exercising, there's a 100% chance that you'll die sooner, you'll get sick, you'll get diseases, and you'll have poor quality of life, which do you prefer? So 50% chance of getting injured if you exercise, 100% chance of your life being pretty crappy if you don't exercise. <laughs> That's the kind of medical professional that you want to have in your life. So if you're going to refer people to a GP, make sure you know who the GP is. One of the challenges with medical referrals is your GP will share uh, if you've got high blood pressure, you shouldn't exercise. That's a classic. I've heard that th literally thousands of times in my career. Well, ultimately, if I want to get healthy and I want to get fit and I've got to get strong, I've got to exercise so that my blood pressure comes down. And one of the biomarkers of being healthy, of course, is that you have a normal blood pressure. So the only way I'm going to get my, my client's blood pressure back to normal is to get them fit and strong. So for a doctor to say, don't exercise, you've got high blood pressure, I could never understand that. But I don't have to understand that. I just had to get a second and third and fourth opinion. I'll go another step further. I've had many clients who've come to me in the absolute, what I would consider the worst news that you could probably be given. Either you have a terminal illness or one of your children or somebody that you really love has a terminal illness. Now that's happened to me many times in my career where my clients have come to me and said, Rowie, what should I do? My mum's been diagnosed with cancer or my child's been diagnosed with this horrible disease or I'm really sick, Rowie, I've been diagnosed and they've told me I'm going to die. Well, I want to share with you very passionately and from my heart to yours as I always do, always do that yes, I've had some of my clients die. But what I've always done with every client is made sure that we go and get a second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth opinion if we need to. And I cannot share with you, I can't count how many times I've had clients that have been told they're going to die or they're going to be incredibly ill for a really long time and they're still alive now and they're only sick for a short period of time. Uh, the medical professionals that you invest time with, that you put your trust in, they, they need to deserve your trust. So please do your research very carefully on the, on the medical professionals that you put into your life. So number one is should you have a good GP? And yes, to cover yourself for insurance purposes, a really good idea to have the backing of a medical doctor to say, Mrs. Jones, you really should be going to Rowie. She needs to be your personal exercise coach because she's going to get your resting heart rate down. She's going to get your high blood pressure down. She's going to get your blood sugar levels down. She's going to get your cholesterol levels down. She's going to make you feel good. You're going to lose weight. We're going to get rid of your depression. Exercise is the best thing for you to do. You need to go and see Rowie. She's a great personal exercise coach. That's the kind of referral you want to have with a medical professional. So that's a GP. A dietitian is really interesting because once again, we're not dietitians we don't specialize in food there's a lot of that i won't call them exercise professionals there's a lot of people involved in fitness that do give a lot of information about food but you can get yourself into a lot of trouble and you could get sued if you do it wrong and i could show you some horror stories of, of fitness instructors who've written people diets and they've ended up in court and been sued because their clients gotten sick or they've been allergic or something horrible has happened because they've given the wrong advice about food so do you need to have a great uh, uh, nutrition slash food slash dietetics person in your circle of influence? And my answer would be yes. Mine is a, a nutrition doctor, a doctor of dietetics. And we have a fantastic relationship because we talk about the science and we go through it together. And she has the same headspace as I do that there is no one medi uh, medical outcome or, or best eating plan for people's medical health. Uh, everybody has different likes, everybody has different dislikes, everybody have, has different reasons for eating food. There's all sorts of things that go on with food. So 
the big recommendation that we've always talked about together is find out about your client. And if you find out about your client, you ask the right questions, and then you realize that this person might have some kind of allergic challenge with food, or they've got a... Uh, there's a medical thing going on inside their body that food has something to do with, then you need to have a, a medical person, a dietetics expert that you can refer them to. So make sure that you find the right person. The next one's very sad for me and very complicated because uh, there's not just food when it comes to physical health, there's food when it comes to mental health. And a lot of my career path has been working with people who have a very poor relationship with food. I'll go a step further because it's not the food that they have a poor relationship with. It's been themselves that they've had a poor relationship with and it's just played out in the, in the way they eat food or don't eat food. So I've had a lot of clients. In fact, at one stage, most of my clients were either anorexics, uh, food bulimics, exercise bulimics, or they were obese. Interestingly, the headspace is the same. Food is controlling their life. So if you're anorexic, if you're bulimic, if you're obese or anything in between, food is controlling your life, which one would suggest then that you need a really good psychologist or psychiatrist or counsellor or neuroscientist, somebody that understands how the brain works. This has been a very disappointing experience for me because I've literally been to thousands of those people. Because I've had such great relationships with my clients, they've asked me to come and meet their psychiatrist or their psychologist or their counsellor and or sit in on the sessions with them. And sadly, uh, I'm asking you very, very carefully to choose this medical professional the most carefully. Unfortunately, in my experience, and I'm only sharing with you what these experts have shared with me, is that most people that become psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, counsellors, and they end up working with people that have some kind of eating challenge, it's because they went to university because they had an eating challenge themselves. So they wanted to help themselves, and that's why they went and studied psychology or psychiatry or etc. Now, I'm, being, I'm not being... Uh, I'm being very disre disrespectful it sounds, but I'm not. I'm just asking you, please, you have the responsibility of looking after your client, yeah? And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who call themselves psycholo psychologists and psychiatrists, and they are on paper, uh, but they've, in my experience, they've made my clients worse because they haven't cared about my client, and I'll give you the worst case scenario is one of my clients shared with me after I'd already been with her to a couple of sessions and she said, Ro, do you think I should keep going? Now that's not, I can't make that decision either. That's not up to us as exercise professionals to make that decision. I just said, you need to trust your gut. Do you want to go again? And she said to me, look, I'll just go one more time by myself. And what happened? This beautiful young girl who I felt that we had been making some progress with her relationship with herself, which of course then would help her relationship with her food. Uh, she'd got into a conversation with this particular head doctor and realised that while she was talking, the psychologist was emailing people at the same time. She was so disinterested in her own client that she was catching up on her emails while my client was talking. So she was at her desk behind her computer. My client was obviously, I presume, lying down on a couch. That's usually the situation. And uh, in, the, in the reflection in the window, my client saw that her psychiatrist, or psychologist I think it was, was catching up on her emails while my client was talking. That's not the kind of professional that I would like to put into anybody's life, let alone somebody that really needs somebody who understands headspaces. So please do your research really carefully. And it goes like this. When I have my initial chat with my client and you have your initial chat with your client, uh, when you find out that there might be some challenges, whether there's injuries or there's medical challenges in the family or you find high blood pressure or uh, there's some kind of uh, mental health challenge, the question is, do you have medical professionals in your life who you trust that I can get in contact with and we can talk about uh, how we can be on your team to help you achieve your goals? I think it's a really important question to add into the initial chat. What do you think? So if your client then says to you, yes, I have a psychologist or yes, I have a psychiatrist or yes, I have a dietitian or a naturopath or an osteopath or a chiropractor or a physiotherapist or a podiatrist, there's a lot of allied health professionals that people trust. Please make the contact with that person 
Give them a call, send them a personal letter, which is probably the best way to do it. Send a personal letter and then call so that you've broken the ice first with a personal letter, hand addressed envelope, colored envelope with a stamp, dear medical professional and obviously use their name. Uh, Mrs. Jones is your client, she's also my client. My goal is to make sure that she helps. I help her achieve her goal by this day, date and time. She has shared with me that you are on her team too. Could we have a phone call? Could we have a face-to-face -face chat about how we can work together to help my client or help our client? Uh, and if you don't get a response from that, if that medical professional doesn't respond to you, uh, in their defense, there's a lot of medical professionals who don't take exercise professionals seriously. So a really good idea when you send that letter is to send a photo or on that letterhead is a photo of you dressed really professionally. Uh, if you rock up to a medical professional's office wearing shorts and a t-shirt or active wear or you just look like a an exercise person, it's highly unlikely they're gonna take you seriously. I've never gone to an, a, a consultation with a medical professional with any of my clients dressed in anything less than a suit. I've called myself an exercise professional and I've been very humble. I understand that somebody that's done six, eight, 10, 15 years of study as a medical professional or an allied health professional deserves my respect and they may not respect me because I belong to a profession, technically an industry, uh, that is not taken seriously. So I have to break down the barriers, not the other way around. If I don't know my stuff, if I don't ask the right questions, if I'm not humble, if I'm not respectful, why would a medical professional or an allied health professional take me seriously? So I'm asking you to do those special things. If you really care about your client and you really want to help them achieve their goals, Find out who else is on their team, who else is in their life, which medical professionals that they trust and believe in, then build a relationship with them as well. So now this person feels like they've got a whole team around them. Yes, I've got an exercise professional, and yes, I've got a dietitian, and yes, I've got a psychologist, and yes, I've got a great physio, and yes, I've got a great chiropractor, and yes, I've got an awesome osteopath. Whatever that person or whoever that person wants to have in their life, would it be a really good idea to build a relationship with them? So to do that, please do it professionally. A letter with a photo in it that makes you look professional, hand-addressed envelope so it actually makes it to them. I'll just give you the reason for that. If you send a professional-looking letter in a white envelope, professionally addressed, to any kind of medical office, it's very likely that the practice manager will open that letter if you send a hand addressed envelope in a colored envelope, particularly red, with a stamp on it, and you address it to Dr. Jones, or and in fact, there's doctors of dietetics, there's doctors, obviously GPs, there's doctors of dietetics, doctors of psychology and psychiatry. So it's dear doctor or dear medical professional, and then the person's name, uh, but hand address the envelope, put a stamp on it, make it a red envelope, that letter will go directly to that medical professional. The practice manager won't open that envelope because it's red and it's personal. So if you would like a very special way to get connected with top level medical professionals, then that would be a, a very cool way to do it and a very professional way to do it because you send the letter and then you back that up with a telephone call. And this is how it's always worked for me. Oh, you're the lady that sent me the red envelope. <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> so if you then want to expand your medical professional base if you want to build referrals and you want to grow your business and the reverse of that if you want medical professionals to refer people to you so you've built in your area you've built a beautiful relationship with all the medical professionals that you feel that you need and you can refer people to them uh, and when we do personal coaching together on this I have letters I have templates that you can use so you can send this letter to the doctor to say I'm the exercise professional in the area this is my client I'd like to talk to you about her particular goals or his particular goals. But the next step up from that is I'm the exercise professional in the area. My goal is for our community to be healthy, fit and strong. I'm sure that's your goal too. Could we get together for a brief chat of seven and a half minutes or 12 and a half minutes or 11 minutes, make sure that it's an uneven number that sounds reasonable. Please don't say five or 10 minutes because that could be an hour and nobody's gonna give you an hour because they're too busy. So can I please have seven and a half minutes of your time 
to chat about how we can improve the health of our community. I want to be able to do that. I'm sure that you do too. So I have a great coaching session that we can do together on that. I've got the letters and the templates for you to, for you to be able to do that. And then that's a great marketing plan as well. So you send a personal letter to the chiropractor, the physio, the dietitian, the podiatrist, the chiropractor, the doctor, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, all the medical professionals in your area. So they know how professional you are so that when somebody comes across their desk that needs to exercise, they're going to refer them to you, not to the gym, not to Google, not to another personal trainer, which they're very unlikely to do. And I always share that horrible story when I spoke at a medical conference and a head cardiologist at one of the big hospitals in Brisbane, Australia, he shared with me that he loves the exercise profession because we dress like strippers. Every time I share that, it makes me feel sick, except that that is his perception of our profession. He has the right to have that perception. I just would like it to be different, of course, but I can't change his mind unless I prove that we are not the people that dress like strippers. So of course that starts with dressing really professionally, acting really professionally, and then having in-depth knowledge. Not to preach at a doctor about in-depth knowledge, that would be rude and disrespectful, yeah? It's about being able to ask the right questions. So when you build a great relationship with a GP, with a psychologist, with an orthopedic surgeon, with a plastic surgeon, with an endocrinologist, there's a big group of people to become really good friends with. You have to be able to ask clever, intelligent questions so that they take you seriously. If you are respectful and if you ask intelligent questions, then they will teach you. And if you're open to learning and you want to be taught, then is it more likely that they will send you customers, clients and more business? And of course, the answer is yes. This woman is a professional or she's an exercise professional who is actually professional. She dresses professional. She knows her stuff. And I can send you to her knowing that she's going to give you a safe exercise program that's effective and it's going to help you lose weight, lower your blood pressure, lower your resting heart rate lower your blood sugar levels, lower your cholesterol levels and make sure that you're healthy, fit and strong again. Wouldn't that be a great way to grow your business? That the medical professionals in your area trust you so much that they would give you their patients, the people that trust them and have paid them enormous amounts of money, they would then send them to you. And that's the, the beautiful example of sitting in the plastic surgeon's office, for example. And I will share that Yes, we have plastic surgeons that have become our really good friends, but not because they were our really good friends. They became our really good friends because they were initially our clients and we'd built a relationship with them. Uh, every medical professional that's in my life be be has come into my life because I connected with them professionally and now we've become really good friends. So it's interesting to sit in a plastic surgeon's office and the referral went like this. I'm not touching you. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to operate on you. I'm not going to do liposuction. I'm not going to do a tummy tuck. I'm not going to do a facelift. I'm not touching you until you go back to Rowie or Cayman and get really fit and really strong. They're the exercise professionals. They'll get you in great shape for your surgery so that your surgery looks really good and it lasts a, re a really long time. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we were referring people to medical professionals that we trust and the medical professionals were referring people to us because they trust us. So the number one word there is professional. Know your stuff, act like a professional, be a professional person, and then be excited that other medical professionals and allied health professionals are referring their clients and patients to you.